Hey, it's Dr. Asatar Bear, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the demand curve and the foundations of demand. Okay, so uh, first of all, this whole section of economic theory, neoclassical economic theory, this is the neo neoclassical theory of price and value. Okay, so the just to define these terms, okay, we'll use P to stand for price, that is what you pay for an item in a market, and W to stand for the value, that is what an item is worth. Right, so long-standing tradition in economic theory of seeing the price and the value as being different things related but different right so price is the appearance of value and value is the essence right so leads to different possibilities of course for example it's possible that the price that you pay in the market is greater than the value right and here we we have a difference in point of view right how the buyer might regard this situation versus how the seller the buyer is probably going to be pretty unhappy with this situation, right? They just got ripped off. This is going to be their face, right? They're upset. It's a rip off. Lame. Versus the seller is going to be probably pretty happy. Yay. I just benefited from this situation, right? All right. So versus it's also possible that the price, of course, is less than the value. And here the buyer is likely to be very happy. Yay, and the seller is likely to be upset, sad. Right? For them, now they see it as a ripoff. Okay, so a lot of economic theory has focused on that prices and values on average are equal, or what are the conditions that lead to price and value being equal, so that both sides are, you know, need. Both sides are sort of like this, right? That neither happy nor sad. It is, in other words, as fair as it is likely to get for both parties. Okay, and in particular, uh, the focus was said that if the market was, we had a perfectly competitive market, or if we had perfect competition, that that was going to equalize price and value and result in a fair situation for both where the price is equal to the value. Let's also say that neoclassical price and value is mostly due to one person, and that is Alfred Marshall, a very important figure in the history of economic thought. Marshall wrote a book uh, in 1890 called Principles of Economics, and that became the book that everyone read, very, very influential. This, this influenced neoclassical thought in a bunch of different ways. Uh, so we're going to follow along with Marshall's presentation uh, of, you know, the way that he proceeded in his argument. Okay, so this is, this is just kind of background right here. All right, so Marshall started off by examining demand. Okay, he said that there is something called a demand function. Right, and the demand function is a mathematical relationship and it's a relationship between two variables, okay? It's a relationship between the price, which we've already discussed, and the quantity demanded, okay? So QD, if that represents the quantity demanded, uh, that is the amount that buyers are willing and able to buy at a given price. Marshall was trying to look at what do all demand curves have in common, right? And he argued that they all have this in common, okay? The derivative of this demand function is less than zero. He called that the law of demand, all right? So what that means is as the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down and vice versa. Price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. And this is ceteris paribus. Okay, we are assuming that all else is being held constant. Now, 
the question that arises is, why should we believe Marshall? Okay, but he's saying there's a law of demand, but give us the reasoning. Okay, the reasoning is, first of all, there's an income effect. Okay, as the price goes up, buyers are not as able to afford the good. Okay, so imagine that our our initial situation, we're talking about an individual, let's say, who who loves apples, okay, the price of, of apples, let's say, is originally a dollar. The person's income is twenty dollars. At one dollar, they're able to afford twenty apples, but at two dollars, they're only able to afford ten. That's the income effect. Pretty simple. And it would work equally well in the opposite direction. The price was to go down, quantity demanded was rise because people are more able to afford the good. All right, now, the second thing is the substitution effect, okay? Not everyone has extreme preferences like this that where they're willing to buy it no matter what the price is. As the price goes up, buyers seek out substitutes. They buy other things. They don't buy exactly the same goods. So if the price of apples goes up, the quantity demanded of apples goes down because some other quantity is going up, like the quantity demanded of, let's say, oranges, let's say orange is a substitute, that goes up, people buy the substitute instead, okay, and vice versa, right, works equally well in the opposite direction, okay. Income effect, substitution effect, Marshall's justification for the law of demand. If we put this together, we're going to get a downward sloping demand curve. All right, so we're going to put price on the vertical axis and quantity demanded on the horizontal axis. All right, let's stick with our Apple example. So the price would be the number of dollars, let's say, per pound of apples, and the quantity demanded would be the number of pounds of apples. All right. So if the law of demand holds, we have a downward sloping demand curve. We're going to label it D. And what it means is at any given price that we can think of, let's say the price is $1, all right, we have a corresponding quantity demanded at that price. All right, so let's say in this case it's, I don't know, 30,000. Okay, one dollar, the price of one dollar, individuals in this market are willing and able to purchase 30,000 apples. And we would have that at each different level of price. Okay, so two dollars, we would have a value for quantity demanded for that as well. All right, let's say it's 16,000, all right, and so forth, okay? There's a lot of points along this curve, right? There's, in fact, there's an infinite number. So what this is saying is we have an infinite amount of information about the relationship between price and quantity in this market. Infinite amount of information, that sounds like a lot, right? Here's the thing, right? Companies do not normally have this amount of information about their product. They don't know exactly all of the points along the demand curve. This reflects a kind of idealized knowledge, right? So just keep this in mind. If we have a demand curve, it represents perfect information about this market, okay? Uh, I should say about one side of the market, right? About the demand side. Perfect information is something that we do not normally have, right? We might have a few points of the demand curve, but the problem is normally if we change the price, normally that ceteris paribus assumption is not met. And usually a bunch of other things change as well. So again, we are assuming we can change the price and see how the buyers respond without changing anything else, okay? So a change in the price causes a movement along the demand curve, all right? So that's what we've depicted here, right? We've got two points that are along this curve, point A and point B, and if we change this price, 
we're going to move along a curve, either up the curve like this or down the curve, right, depending on what the price change is, depending on where we started, okay? So, and we have another thing that can happen, right, which is that we can have something else change, not the price. Let's say that the price remains constant, right? Like the price stays constant at $2, and we, we know that before people were buying 16000 But let's say now something else is happening, right? That, that at a price of $2, we have a new outcome where people are now buying more than they were before. Okay, let's say that they're buying now 25000 at that price. So something new has happened, okay? To, for us to reach point C, it's not reached by a change in the price, right? The, change, the price has not changed. Something else must have happened, okay? And this brings us to a shift in the demand curve. All right, shifts in demand, by that we mean either an increase or a decrease, okay? And I want to encourage you to think about these in terms of uh, right versus left. Okay, so like in our example here, getting to point C means that we're, we've got a new thing happening. That is terrible what I did there. We've got a new demand curve going on here, D1 to D2. Uh, it has shifted to the right. And we can see this is an increase because at the same price, people are buying more than they were before, 25,000 versus 16,000. All right, so shifts in demand can happen due to several different factors, okay? There could be, number one, a change in the income of buyers, right? People get more income, they buy more of all kinds of stuff, right? That's, that's pretty... Uh, Pretty well understood they get less income they're gonna buy less okay it could be a change in simply the number of consumers all right sometimes this is called a change in the size of that market itself okay so the easiest way to increase demand is to sell on a larger market all right this is why the uh the desire for more trade has so often gone hand in hand with mass production. Okay, so uh, number three could be a change in the preferences of consumers, right? That is their desires, the stuff that they like and dislike. Perhaps new information has led to a change in people's desires. Oh, it turns out apples are very good for you. We want them more than we did before, all right? could be a change in the price of uh, related goods. All right, so let's uh, expand on this a little bit. Let's say that the price of a substitute good, let's say it's oranges, has gone down. Right? The price of oranges going down, well, that causes the quantity demanded of oranges to go up. Where does that quantity come from? Well, some of it comes from the Apple market, okay? So a decrease in the price of a substitute good is gonna tend to reduce the demand, okay? So going from D1 to D3, for example, all right? Substitutes. Or let's say we were talking about a complement Okay, so complements are things which go together, like example, we have car uh, and we have gas, all right? So gas and cars. So if the price of gas was to increase, this decreases the demand for cars, all right? So we would see a movement to the left from that, okay? Or a decrease in the price of, of gas would incre uh, increase the demand for cars. All right, so substitutes and complements change in the price of related goods, okay? All these things shift the demand, all right? And our last one is a change in people's expectations. Expectations is people's view of the future. 
your view of the future changes, then your behavior now might change. Right. So people, uh, pe what, what people do now is a product of what they think is going to happen in addition to what is happening. Right. Um, so if you thought, well, apples are going to go extinct or whatever, uh, this, this is, there's going to be fewer and fewer apples in the future, you might well be interested in buying more of them now, uh, you know, before they're all gone or whatever it is. All right, so five different factors that cause shifts in demand. Think about those shifts as occurring to the right or to the left. All right, so this is my, the end of my lecture on demand. Thank you.